Welcome to First Sin Fiction, your first stop for learning to write fantastic fiction. I'm your host, Aaron Gansky, author of The Bargain, The Hand of Bad Night series, and First in Fiction. And I'm Alton, typewriter addict Gansky, uh, <laughs> coming to you from the middle part of uh, the state of California, author of uh, about 45 books. I'm Molly Jo Reilly, producer of the podcast, Social Media Ninja, and author of the upcoming location mystery, NOLA. And yeah. with us today, we've got Kathy Eide. Um, under the show notes, I said that she was going to introduce herself, but I, I jumped ahead because I'm an eager little little boy and, and wanted to mention that uh, Kathy and I have known each other for uh, quite some time now since yeah. uh, the Orange County Christian Writers Conference and had the pleasure of meeting you there. And uh, you are the director of the Orange County Christian Writers Conference, uh, also a writer and editor extraordinaire. So you've got uh, several sombreros that you wear. Um, anything else that you'd like to add to that? I'm also the uh, founder and director of two organizations for Christian editors, the Christian Pen for Freedoms and Editors Network and the Christian Editor Connection. Excellent. So you are uh, very steeped in the editing, and I think I just passed off an editing job to you Yes, today. you did. Thank you. So, I appreciate that. Right. Yeah, good referrals there. So. Um, we want to welcome all of you who are listening on the audio podcast, and we'd like to invite you to join us uh, live every Tuesday at 6.30 in the p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We do record live via Google Hangouts, and you can find us either through Facebook or you can connect with us on your Google Circles, uh, the Google Plus accounts, and uh, that way you'll get the invitations uh, for sure. And you can watch us live and participate in the chat room and ask all sorts of questions live. And speaking of asking questions live, if you are unable to watch us live, you can still submit a question via Ask the Author, uh, which is on my website, AaronGansky.com, and we are trying to bribe you, bribe our listeners for questions. And so if you go to my website, AaronGansky.com, click on Ask the Author, uh, and fill out the, the form with a question for us, uh, we'll answer it on the air, and you will receive a free code to download a copy of The Bargain, my, my uh, debut novel. Um, it's on Audible, and it is a fantastic novel and fantastic reading that the guy did. And so far, we've uh, Bruce Brady submitted a question, so I need to contact him and get him his code so he can download that. Uh, but keep those questions coming. We want to feature that each week, uh, so we're looking forward to that. And with that in mind, I'll kick it over to you, Pops, for our publishing term of the week. All righty. Well, in light of uh, what we'll be talking about here in a few minutes, uh, I chose the word compilation. Compilation is a, a series of either articles or a series of uh, short stories that are bound into a single book, uh, usually with a theme of some sort. And uh, these to be very popular. Then um, they kind of faded out. Now they've been kind of coming back. And probably the best compilation series, best known compilation series, is uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul, perhaps. And um, uh, maybe Kathy will be giving us a few others as we uh, as we go along. So. Compilation, and uh, sometimes you'll get invitations to participate in a compilation uh, to either write something and uh, your name goes in the book as one of the authors. So compilation is our publishing term of the week. All right. Thanks, Pops. And so the reason that we, we chose that particular one is because, Kathy, you've got a new compilation uh, coming out called 21 Days of Christmas, and this is kind of a, you say, a fiction lover's devotional. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about uh, first of all, what a devotional is, um, and then also um, just a little bit more about this compilation, 21 Days of Christmas, that you put together. Well, 21 Days of Christmas is actually the second book in uh, the Fiction Lovers Devotional series. The first one came out in June. It's 21 Days of Grace, stories that celebrate God's unconditional love. And those are kind of self-explanatory uh, stories about, uh, about God's grace to us. Um, each book in the series has 21 different chapters, and each chapter has a short fiction story followed by a life application, each chapter written by a different author. Um, we've got some best-selling authors, we've got some mid-range authors, and we've got some brand-new writers uh, in each of the books. Excellent. Um, I am curious, and, and one of the reasons that I wanted to... to um, talk to you about this. Is I think you actually asked me to submit something, and I never did because I'm a terrible, <laughs> terrible individual human being. Um, but I've always been fascinated with this idea of 
as an editor um, of the Citron Review for an, a number of years, um, collecting submissions and publishing um, compilations, etc. I've never done a, a published uh, hardbound. Ours has only been digital. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm interested in your collection of stories. Why don't you, if you don't mind, talk to us a little bit about the process. How did you solicit the submissions? Uh, what did the acceptance process look like? Um, and you know, how many were were you looking? How many submissions did you see versus how many you were able to accept? Those types of things. Well, the idea for a fiction lover's devotional actually came to me probably 16 years ago, um, and I was just thinking, you know, I love Christian fiction. I've seen the power of it in people's lives, but when you go to have your quiet time with the Lord, reading a chapter from a novel just doesn't seem quite appropriate. So I thought, wouldn't it be great to have short fiction stories with those life applications where the author can bring out the themes and messages that the author had in mind when she wrote that, or he. Um, and so I, I talked to several authors that I've met over the years at writers' conferences, like yourself, uh, and some people that I'd met through my editor business. and. I just said, you know, what do you think of this idea? You know, what do you want to submit something to me? And I got several. I got some wonderful ones. Submitted them to publishers, and they all just kind of looked at me and said, "Wait, what? It's fiction, but it's a devotional." And you know, so they couldn't quite get the concept. And several of them said, "Oh well, you know, devotionals don't sell. Compilations don't sell. You know." So it was one of those things where I think the idea was ahead of its time. And as Alton mentioned, compilations are starting to come back. So we're seeing more of them now, and it just took a while to find the right publisher for it. When I did, though, Broad Street Publishing offered me a four-book series contract um, just because they caught the vision for what this could be. So um, I, I had those stories from the first idea that I had years ago and was using those stories in the proposal. So I had some to start with, but I needed more than what I had at the time and I couldn't get a hold of some of the people who had submitted 16 years before. So um, I just kind of put out the word to, again, more of the authors that I'd met over the years and to, um, you know, through the conferences and through my editing and ask for submissions and I got inundated. <laughs> it was flooded with wonderful, wonderful submissions. It was really hard to choose just 21 for each each book. Actually, 20 if I wanted to put in one myself, which I did on most of them. Absolutely. Very, very interesting stuff. Uh, you mentioned the uh, fiction devotional, and devotionals are, are, are they're Christian uh, based and um, really designed to kind of help um, deepen your understanding of Jesus, uh, of God, and to kind of strengthen that relationship. Is that correct? Yes, I, I would say so, yeah. Yeah, so kind of to reaffirm your faith and, and challenge your faith in some, and, and different devotionals do different things, but they're really geared toward kind of personal betterment in terms of your faith. And so I, I can understand a little bit of, of perhaps confusion um, in thinking that how can fiction do this. Uh, but I, I think we had this kind of conversation. Um, and I'm going to, I'm, this is unscripted, so I'm going to throw a, an unscripted question at you, and then I'm going to also, I'd love to hear Pops, your thought on this. Um, about the role that fiction plays in people's lives. You wouldn't have done this project if you didn't believe that fiction can dramatically affect a person's lives, uh, life, their outcome, or their outlook, rather. Um, is, is that kind of what, that you, the passion that you have, is that fiction changes people? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I've seen it in my own life where I'm reading a story and I can relate to the characters, and they may be going through particular circumstances that I haven't been through, but the situation has some relevance, some comparison to something that I've gone through. And so to see how that character handled the situation, what they did right, what they didn't do right, you know, and be able to kind of imagine myself in that situation and compare it to my own, um, really does help me to see God in a story. And when you've got a fiction story, as, as Alton often says, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, and when you see that end, that in relationship to the rest of the story, you can kind of look at your own life and say, okay, I'm in the beginning of this situation, or I'm in the middle. I haven't gotten to the end yet, but God has an ending for me. And it may not be what I think would be my happy ending. It may be different from what I have in mind, which often happens in fiction too. Um, but there will be a satisfying conclusion to it at some point, maybe not even in this life, maybe in the next life. But 
to see it from a perspective of fiction, to be able to say, even in my own life, there are things that are going to happen that will have a beginning, they'll have an end, they'll have all these twists and turns along the way, it makes it easier to, to, to figure those things out in your own life. And I've, I've heard so many stories of people who have, you know, couples whose marriages were saved because they read a novel about a couple who had troubles and they saw how that couple resolved the issues and they were able to kind of do a little bit of that in their own lives. Um, girls who decided to not get an abortion or not in, get involved with their boyfriends before marriage. You know, just so many situations that fiction has changed people's lives. Absolutely. And now, Pops, you've written both fiction and nonfiction. Um, and I, I've always been fascinated with the difference between the two and, and um, the power that fiction has that I, I don't think a lot of people really understand or give it credit for being able to have a dramatic impact on, on people's lives. So, uh, Pops, I'm just going to you know, kind of involve you in the conversation here. In your writing both nonfiction and fiction, what do you see as the difference between the two, and, and do you see as dramatic of an impact from fiction as you do from nonfiction? <clears throat> well, fiction could definitely uh, change things. When Abraham Lincoln uh, met the author um, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, he said, so this is the little lady that started this great big war. And uh, some historians uh, say that that was the breaking point. That was the that was the match that uh, started things. Of course, you know it would have started sooner or later anyway. But it was that bit of fiction that uh, called people to uh, to action, and that's been true often in history. Now, normally you don't depend on fiction to be world changing, but it can happen. Uh, a lot of laws were changed in England because of Dickens' uh, description of the street urchins and the sweatshops that they had to work in, and that brought that social need forward. And uh, so action was taken there, and uh, there's really a whole bunch of historical things. So fiction can uh, change not only an individual's life, but it can change the course of history uh, and has done so in the past. Uh, and what, what Kathy's doing here, and another good term for this would be an anthology. You mm -hmm. often see uh, science fiction anthologies, uh, mystery anthologies that, uh, that came out of the pulp magazine, so it would be the best science fiction stories of 2015. And you can uh, read through those. <clears throat> uh, so, in a sense, this is uh, an anthology, also as well as a compilation, and you could use the terms interchangeably. I think in this case. Now, the difference between fiction uh, and nonfiction, and uh, I can fill the rest of the hour uh, just on that, but <laughs> I'll do it in short order here. And that is, uh, fiction is exploration, and nonfiction is education. So, we normally turn to a nonfiction book if we want to learn something. So a while back, I was looking at David McCullough's book on the, uh, the Wright brothers, and I wanted to learn about all they went through to uh, design and invent this airplane and everything that happened to them afterwards. So I was there for education. I wasn't there for entertainment. What fiction does is allow us to explore some of those things. So you could take that same concept uh, and um, fictionalize their lives. Um, uh, like it was Irving Stone wrote... Uh, uh, one on uh, Charles Darwin, the, the sailing of the Beagle, uh, and he fictionalized the whole thing. It was all based on the history, but nonetheless, instead of just reading about it, you experienced it through fiction. So fiction tends to be more emotive. Uh, not always. I've read some nonfiction that still gives me nightmares. Um, uh, day one, for example, dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, which I read 20 years ago, still haunts me. Uh, so it can be very emotive, but generally fiction will use more emotion in its goal is to make the reader experience something. Nonfiction, is, its primary goal is make the reader, reader think something or know something. Like you that. know, uh, yeah, Tim O'Brien wrote uh, in uh, The Things They Carry, there's a story called uh, How to Tell a True War Story, and in it he talks about how fiction reveals truth how nonfiction might reveal a truth, but that mm -hmm. fiction can reveal truth. And even though mm -hmm. uh, fiction, by definition, is not true, um, it can talk about the great themes of life, love, death, loss, um, hope, joy. Um, it can get to the, the heart of those in a way that sometimes nonfiction can't. Um, that's not to say that nonfiction is, is useless in that regard, but um, it... it 
like you say, fiction is more emotive. It makes people feel. And so because of that, I think it's it's actually a natural combination, um, Kathy, to, to combine fiction with devotions. I think it's a great idea, a unique idea. Um, well, you know, that's, it, it's not as unique as one might think. Uh, it is in this era, maybe, but uh, Jesus did the same thing. You know, he would tell a story, and a lot of his stories, the parables, were fiction. But then he would follow it up by talking to his disciples and explaining to them what the different parts of the story meant and how that was to affect their lives. So it, it's got a pretty good precedent. Absolutely, absolutely. So now if we've got listeners thinking, okay, I, I'm interested, I, I wouldn't mind submitting to something like this, they might be curious about how payment works. So you've got 21 different submitters. Um, I, I imagine, actually, I guess some of them submit multiple stories. Yes. Um, how how do you work that with the publication and the contract and who gets what percent? And, uh, and that to me is just so many numbers, my, my head goes numb. How did you guys work that out? <laughs> well, yes, that was one of the things that I talked to the publishers about when I submitted the proposals because that was their first thought was, how in the world are we going to divide royalties 21 different ways? And instead, I said, you know, don't worry about that. I will make sure that I take care of the contributors and, you know, the deal is just between you and me. So the contract is actually between me and the publisher. Um, I get the royalties on the book. Um, my original thought was, you know, maybe I could convince the publisher to, you know, just pay something, you know, $25, $50, something like that. But what Broadstreet did was they very generously offered 10 free copies of the book to all the contributing authors and at a $14.95 retail that's about $150 value uh, and then in addition the publisher is allowing contributing authors to purchase additional copies not only of the devotional that they're in but of any book in the Fiction Lovers devotional series at 65% off retail and then they can either use those as gifts or you know sell them and make a profit that way so Theoretically, you know, if a contributing author wanted to, they could make a pretty decent amount of money off of their first 10 books that they get for free in addition to um, the books that they can purchase at 65% off. Yeah, let me throw something in here uh, because I like to do the educational part of things. 65% uh, off is higher than what most authors get for their books. Uh, usually an author is able to buy their books. They get a certain number free, like I'll get 50 free books. Um, but then if I want to buy more books, I can buy them. That really amounts to the bookstore rate, and it's usually 55%. So they're giving an additional 10%, yes. uh, which I, I think is interesting. And so that's just you know for our, uh, our viewers and our listeners to, to understand what the norm is. Uh, a bookstore will buy in about half the cover price of a, of a book, and then they sell it for the full cover price. They get to keep half. And uh, that's how they make their money. So um, by providing it at discounted rates like that, it really helps the author. Yeah, I, I was very impressed with Broad Street for offering that. Yeah. Very cool, very cool. Um, but our, our topic today is holiday fiction. So I, I want to transition into that. And I was just very curious, so I appreciate the illumination of the education there <laughs> on the business side of things and, and compilations. And I think we could fill up the entire hour just talking about that. But let's kind of switch more toward our theme for tonight, which is holiday fiction, writing holiday, writing about the holidays. Specifically, your book, 21 Days of Christmas, is about Christmas. We've got Christmas coming up, so we timed it um, that way. So we'll focus mainly on, on Christmas, but I think in, in some of your answers and responses, what our listeners will find is that they can take the same principles and apply them to other holidays. Uh, I did one, uh, a blog post some time ago called Mining the Holidays about how to get um, the most out of, uh, of the holiday experience in terms of your fiction and how to let the holidays inform your fiction. So with that in mind, kind of the, the thoughts that I had, I was curious to hear what thoughts you had. If somebody, if I were to submit a story to you for 21 Days of Christmas, was there a particular element or elements that you were looking for that needed to be present in each story for it to really scream out Christmas? Well, um, the stories didn't need to scream out Christmas, just had to have something about Christmas woven in there. Uh, some of the stories that we have are fictionalized accounts of the first Christmas, you know, Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus and the star and 
you know, the manger and all the things that we associate with, with our Christmas traditions, some of them are perspectives on what happened in that first Christmas. But most of them are about modern day people uh, celebrating that event or maybe not celebrating it. Maybe, you know, dealing with some issues that cause them to decide, you know what, I'm just not into celebrating Christmas this year. And so, you know, it kind of deals with a, a variety of that. And so in some cases, Christmas is just kind of the backdrop to a, a story that's not really about Christmas, but the things that are going on, the characters' lives are highlighted. They're stronger because of the Christmas season. Oh, I like that. I like that, that it's not the focus, but it's something that strengthens the, uh, yeah. the story as a whole. Um, that's good. My wife watches the Hallmark Channel. Um, I don't know if I should admit that on the air, but she does. And so, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Aaron. I... Are you done now? The podcast I'm, I'm over. sorry, Aaron. <laughs> I'm out of here now. Yeah. She, uh, she, she records all these movies, and um, to a certain extent, uh, most of them are, are, at least now, this time of year, they're all based on Christmas, and, and they all take place around yeah. the Christmas thing. So there's definitely a market for it, um, but I like how you say that, that the this, this setting, the time period, should um, strengthen the story rather than being the story. Absolutely. And, yeah, I just kind of want to say one of the advantages to writing with with the, the holidays in mind is the fact that it can really develop your characters because we all celebrate Christmas. Well, we don't all celebrate Christmas, but those of us who do celebrate Christmas celebrate it differently. Yes. And so uh, my family traditions are going to be different than your family traditions are going to be different than our listeners' right. family traditions. But there are going to be some commonalities. And so it creates a, a kind of a... a, a level playing field um, for us to empathize with the characters mm -hmm. and how they perceive those holidays is going to immediately help define their characters. Think of uh, uh, A Christmas Carol and how Scrooge feels and now we call people Scrooge. Right. Um, right. It's part of our culture and so that reveals an aspect of his character. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, it, that, that's very interesting to me. I, I'm curious in the process of this, did you find writers making um, the same mistakes? Is there like kind of a list of common mistakes that you found that you think our, our listeners should avoid? Well, um, one thing I noticed when I received the submissions, especially for 21 Days of Christmas, some of them really read like nonfiction. They read like a true story. And because I think that's because there's so many true story compilations out there. They were thinking chicken soup. They were thinking those kinds of things. So they sent a story called it fiction, but it really didn't read like fiction. And it may have been fiction, but it didn't read like fiction. So that's a, a subtle thing I looked for. But I wanted to find stories that had characters I could relate to, characters that other readers could relate to, that you could feel for, you understood what they wanted, um, and you wanted them to get it. Or maybe not get it, but get something better. Get something you know that was better for them than what they originally wanted. So I was looking at the story arc, I was looking at the character arc, I was looking at just what the use of good fiction writing techniques. A lot of the submissions I received, it, it seemed clear to me that the author hadn't really studied fiction writing techniques, the point of view and show don't tell, and you know, using descriptions and you know, those kinds of things. Um, I was also looking for type writing. When you've got a 1700 word word count, um, you have to have the beginning and middle and end happen pretty quickly. You have to have, um, you know, set up your character pretty quickly, set up the motivations and goals quickly. Um, and so I was looking for stories that did that well, that um, allowed the reader to really get into the story quickly and, and powerfully and really be looking for that. And because I'm an editor, I was also looking for clean writing, you know, no typos, uh, the punctuation all in the right face, you know, are all in the right places, the, you know, the grammar, um, all those kind of things, you know, to be, you know, as clean as it could be. I ended up editing every chapter, even the best-selling authors, you know, I, I did a little bit of editing on their pieces and they were happy to have that. Um, but the less editing I had to do, the better for me, so, you know, I was looking for clean, tight writing um, in all of the submissions. And then for a life application that in an even shorter amount of word count really brought out the messages and really gave the readers something to think about. Excellent. 
Yeah, I, I'm curious. Um, it's kind of an unscripted question here, but what role did the holidays play in that? What role did Christmas play in the story arc? Were you looking for it to be incorporated? Um, that that it did play. You said earlier that it, you wanted it to strengthen the piece. Did you see Christmas strengthening story arcs, or did you see it just strengthening the show don't tell aspects of setting? Um, what what did you find to be the most useful usage of the Christmas holiday season? Um, it, it different stories had had different aspects of it. Um, the story that I chose to put in first, because some of the the stories are about the first Christmas and other stories are about modern day, the first story I chose to have in the compilation did both. It had a nice juxtaposition where you start with this modern day family. They're in the car driving to the relative's house and they got off to a late start and traffic is terrible and everybody's hungry. And so there's all the arguing that goes on in the car, you know, with the family. And, you know, the kids are playing with the foil on the jello salad in the back seat. And mom and dad say, you know what, let's just calm them down by telling them the Christmas story. Uh, what do you mean? The one about Santa? No, 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 that other one, you know, from the Bible. You know, and so they start talking about, well, there, there was this, uh, uh, there, there was no room in the inn, I remember that, and how did they get to Bethlehem? The donkey or a chariot or, you know, and so they're, they're trying to tell the Christmas story, but they're not really familiar with it. And then you cut from that to the real Christmas, the real first Christmas, where Mary and Joseph, you know, were in a position where they had to go into this stinky, filthy manger to give birth to the Son of God. And then your modern day couple is saying, you know, well, we're hungry, but I ain't going in that place. That's the only place that's open on Christmas Eve. I'm not going in there. You know, and so to, to put those next to each other really made a powerful message, I thought, about our, our traditions. You know, you've got the little drummer boy. Well, where'd the little drummer boy come from? He's not in scripture. You know, but, that, you know, you kind of, we kind of, in our culture, have kind of combined our own little Christmas traditions with the original Christmas story and so I thought it made a really powerful impact to compare the two. I agree. I like the idea of the juxtapos juxtaposition of the two. Um, that is very powerful. So um, excellent. So the, the use of it to for the story arc and then also to help reveal some of the characters and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, very good. So what do you think were the greatest challenges that, that our listeners might face when writing about the holidays? What traps might they fall into or, or what might they find most uh, challenging? Well, we all have, as you said, our, our own ways of celebrating the holiday, and they're precious to us. You know, we treasure those, those memories, those traditions, but another family is going to have very different traditions. And so to write about the holidays, you may think it's kind of universal because it's your experience, but to translate that into what other people who have very different experiences, um, to make sure to help them see how, why it's a treasured tradition. To you or to your characters in the case of fiction um, can be difficult. I think one of the uh, challenges too is that we're all so familiar with the Bible story. We're so familiar with the nativity. Those of us who read Christian you know, fiction or devotionals, we know about Mary and Joseph and the donkey and the star and the manger, no room at the end. We know all that. So to give that a fresh perspective is quite a challenge. And the stories that I did have that are biblical fiction in this compilation really brought a fresh perspective to that traditional story. Um, the one that I chose to wrote to write in there and, and include in the book is uh, from Joseph's perspective, uh, right after Mary had given birth, and from what he had been taught his whole life about the Messiah, to take what he'd been taught and see this little baby who looked just like any other little baby. Um, how that affected him, you know, what what he thought, you know, you, you're not supposed to, you're just a carpenter, you're not supposed to go near anything holy, but this holy son of God, the most holy thing that he, he'd ever experienced in his life, he's got to go change that diaper, you know, <laughs> um, you know, just the, 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 the way it, it affected him as, a, as an individual, and I think that um, perspective is something that we can relate to. You know, we, we know God, we love God, we want to um, worship Him, but sometimes what we think of God and what is reality conflicts. Absolutely. I, and that's, I think, the, the struggle, not just for holiday fiction, but for any fiction, is making something that's so well-worn 
seems right. fresh and new. Um, I'm, I cannot remember who said the quote. I didn't plan on using this tonight, but every every unhappy family is unhappy in their own way. Yes. Yeah, and and that's one of the things that I think about with holiday <laughs> fiction is creating um, a, a tension, a conflict. Um, mm -hmm. Christmas for me is a very happy time, um, and it's really kind of the I guess if I think of my own Christmas journey, if you want to say it that way, um, from when I was a kid and it was all magical and and there are gifts under the trees and it's family time and it's eggnog. Um, I think probably my favorite Christmas is once I started having children. Uh, yes. I remember the the Christmas before we had children. I was like, I ain't decorating. Like, what do yeah. we need a tree for? You know. <laughs> all of a sudden I have kids, and I'm like, let's do trees. Let's do ornaments. Yes. Let's, let's yes. hang things up. Let's do tinsel. And I hate tinsel, but let's put some tinsel. <laughs> up, you know. And um, so for me. Um, the experience has been renewed through their eyes, yes. and and um, I guess that might be one strategy is to displace yourself and try and experience Christmas through somebody else's um, experiences to see through somebody else's eyes. Um, you know, if you love the traditional ham dinner or turkey dinner, whatever it is that you normally have on Christmas, try and imagine the person who hates it. Um, you know, when you look at the Christmas lights and, and it immediately fills you with a swelling of anticipation and joy, um, try and think of the person who it fills with dread and loneliness. Um, and, it's it's and funny you say that because there is one of the stories in the compilation about a woman who, when she saw the Christmas lights, it caused her pain. Um, and it was because uh, her dad had passed away at Christmas. And, you know, the, she, she associated Christmas lights with the death of the dad. So... Oh. Absolutely. Just like what you said, you know, to see it from a different perspective. Absolutely. And for every happy memory, <laughs> this is going to get really dark. <laughs> it's, it's for every happy memory that we have of the holiday, somebody else has a tragic memory. Absolutely. Um, it's either they've lost somebody close to them near the holidays, or um, they're spending it alone for the first time. Yes. Yes. Okay, so, you know, uh, even if they've lost somebody that year, the first Christmas without... Um, grandma, the first Christmas right. without, you know, sister or whatever it is, it can be pretty even, heartbreaking. Even the loss of a job, you know, you lose your job right before Christmas. Suddenly Christmas takes on a different, you know, emotion because you you had planned on giving the kids this great Christmas like you always do with all the tinsel in the tree and you can't afford even tinsel, much less a tree. I'm going to get a little bit personal here in talking about the holidays. I hope that's okay. Um, but I don't know. What do you um, think, Pops? Is that all right? <laughs> Pops, you all right? I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. I can tell you that um, that quote is from uh, Leo Tolstoy, Anna ah, yes. Karina. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, it's good to tell a guy with the MFA. <laughs> you know, I've heard these, I've heard these, uh, you know, quotable phrases just time and time again, and I remember the phrases, and I can never remember who said them because I'm. I the actual, you know, yeah. The actual yeah. quote is: "Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family." is unhappy in its own way. Yes. Yeah. And and I, I tell my students that when they have the stereotypes of the, you know, angry drunk father or whatever, right. I'm like, okay, but what kind of a drunk is he? And that seems seems that's a weird question to ask. What kind of a drunk is he? Um the, the there's the the story of Metallica, the great, you know, metal band and um they had one of the greatest guitar players ever and they kicked him out of the band because he was a mean drunk. Everybody else was a funny drunk. And yeah. so when you have that kind of unhappiness um, knowing just the minutia of it, oh, my dad used to say hurtful things. Well, what what hurtful things did he say? It, it shouldn't right. be the stock, you know, types of things. And full disclosure, pops never abused me at all. Um, for for weeks, he was fine. Well, um, not around Christmas. Not not around Christmas. No. <laughs> um, just wet noodles. He just beat me with wet noodles. Is what it was. So, um, but I remember pops one one year you having to tell us we're not going to have a very big Christmas or, or we're going to have a really small Christmas or we may not even have gifts this year because we were tight. Um, we were in San Diego at the time, I think. And you remember that, Pops? No, I try to shut those things out of my mind, but yeah, there's there's a vague recollection and I, I want to thank you for bringing that up again. I, well, the reason I bring it up, I marked all of them, by the way. Uh, it was 1984, it was 1987, it was 88... <laughs> And it was 92, 93, 94, all put together. No, I'm joking. Um, 
I had this conversation with my wife when we were sitting at Chick-fil-A in Bakersfield wondering what to do with our car that we had just spent 1700 bucks to fix that was now mm. broken again, uh, which is why I missed last week. Thanks, Pops, for stepping up and, and doing a great job with that that podcast and Molly Joe helping to run the show there. Um, I remember telling she's like, we've got to get the car fixed, and I was, I was you know, really upset. I said, so we're just not going to have Christmas this year. Like, we had plans. We were going to get gifts for our family, for our children, and so we're just going to tell them, like, drink some eggnog and call it a day. Like, that just seems really <laughs> unsatisfying. Um, but that's one of the things that I think, <laughs> strangely, is most exciting about holiday fiction is not um, necessarily the joy and, and the hope that it brings, but the 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 conflict. It's re, it's it's a breeding ground yes. for conflict and finding the right conflict that doesn't feel cliche and overdone right. can be a real challenge. And so that's something that you want to really kind of work at, I think, and and develop and and do some brainstorming and really try and challenge yourself to find something unique for it. And that's I think I think that's probably the greatest challenge of it. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, and and then along with that, to have an ending that provides hope, um, not hope of we're going to have more money for Christmas next year, um, but real hope that you know, like like the Grinch who stole Christmas. We may not have the gifts, but that doesn't mean it's not Christmas. It still can be Christmas because Christmas isn't about the gifts, and and to remind ourselves of that in a unique and fresh way, really, um, I think it is something you can do through the power of fiction. Do you think that's what old Henry was getting at in the gift of the Magi? Absolutely. Where, where everything gets reversed on them, they make great sacrifice for one another, nice. and ends up being useless gifts. Um, but I was always warmed by that because it didn't matter; they both sacrificed for one another. Yes, and, and, and it was, was the sacrifice that was the gift, not the gift yeah, itself. That's right, and that was that was Christmas that they'd be willing to give up something they loved uh, yes. to be able to give a, a small gift. They love They're all getting all eyed now. So. <laughs> well, that's the season, right? <laughs> that's the point. That's what the holidays are about. It's, it's weeping. Yes, um, absolutely. So. Well, a lot of people uh, may not uh, think about it this way, but since this is a Christian devotion, we can we can bring this up. There are really two Christmases in this country, uh, in many Western countries, really. There is the one that most people are familiar with. It's the uh, secular Christmas. That's the Santa Claus, the elves, the gift-giving, the tree... Well, the tree is usually traced back to Martin Luther, but um, <laughs> if that, that part's true or not, I don't know. Um, but then there's the uh, the spiritual side, which has nothing to do with any of those things. Uh, and so there's really two Christmases, and I think that's why some people are confused at Christmas time, because mm -hmm. uh, they're almost contradictory at points. Um, so instead of, you know, going out and killing yourself on Black Friday to buy Christmas gifts, when uh, really what matters is whether or not you're going to be able to spend some time with the family. You yeah. know, you got people who love you. That's uh, that's really about all all one needs. You know, I, I had this great moment last night. Pops, you'll appreciate this. Watching Monday Night Football. It was it was the it was the Ravens and the Cleveland Browns. It was a two and eighteen versus a three and seventeen, which just was shaping up to be like a, an awful awful game. But it turned out to be fantastic. But what I loved about it is I watched out in the living room. I had all three boys watching it with me, and I was able to explain some of the minutia of it. We had a fire in the fireplace. The Christmas tree was on. It was super cozy. We were snuggling. And I was like, this is... I mean, we're not opening gifts, but this is just about as good as it gets. Um, well, nothing says Christmas like football, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It wasn't snowing, but if it were, I mean... So, um, so we've talked a little bit about the challenges, and we've talked a little bit about the advantages that it provides in context of it being rife with with uh, conflict. What other advantages do you see, Kathy, as to writing about the holidays? Well, um, whether whether we may see it as separate from the real reason for the season or not, uh, Christmas is about giving gifts, uh, whether big or small. You know, something from the heart, hopefully. But uh, what that means is that books are a great, a great sell during the holiday season, especially during Christmas. A book is something you can get for someone, even 
even if they're not a Christian, you could get them a, a book on the 21 days of Christmas because they're Christmas stories and everybody loves Christmas stories. Um, so you can, and you can give a gift. It's it's 14.99 cover price. You might have sold, you know, you might have bought it for 10 bucks on Amazon. So you can give it to, you know, your postman or you know somebody who's just kind of done something nice for you, um, and spread that hope and that joy of the season um, to someone, even if it's not someone who might maybe be planning to give you something in return. Um, and these days, so many people are so pinched for, for cash, um, it's nice to be able to say, you know what, let's just exchange something inexpensive, you know, just, you know, under 20 bucks. Well, there you go, you've got a book. And so during the holiday season, especially Christmas, is a great time to have a holiday book that you can promote and advertise and offer to people who are looking for uh, something that they can give as a gift to family and friends. And if I can piggyback on that, because you're talking now financially about the market, um, Christmas comes around every year. Yeah. And so you write one Christmas book, you can sell it each year. Yeah. And so even though it's probably not going to move many copies in June or July, in November it might start heating up again, and it's something yeah. that you can, um, especially self-published writers, um, yes. or, or even just with small presses, uh, any writer who has to do their own marketing, um, to have that gives you kind of an immediate platform, um, and a, a good reach. So, financially speaking, it's a good good idea. And, and if you, of, yeah, go ahead. If you can, like we were talking about, if Christmas or whatever the holiday is you're writing about is just kind of part of it, but not necessarily the main thing about it. You could even sell that book during the year. Now, 21 Days of Christmas is going to sell at Christmas. Um, but the next book in this series is 21 Days of Love, Stories that Celebrate Treasured Relationships. We're going to put that out in time for Valentine's Day, but it doesn't say Valentine's Day in the title, and not all of the stories are about Valentine's Day. They're not even about romantic love. They've got parent-child and student-teacher, and they've got lots of stories that are just about love, and you can celebrate love all year round. Uh, the fourth book in the series is 21 Days of Joy, Stories that Celebrate Mom. Uh, we're putting it out in time for Mother's Day, but you can celebrate mom all year round. So if you can tie your book into a holiday, but not just that holiday, then you can take advantage of the holiday book sales opportunity, but also be able to sell that book throughout the year. So that would be the distinction between being set during Christmas and being about Christmas? Yeah. Yeah. And and I think, you know, with a novel, with a full-length novel, you want to make sure that your characters experience the holidays that happen to come up. Um, a lot of the manuscripts that I've edited, um, the character will be, you know, having something go on in April, and then something goes on in May, and something goes on in June, and I'm like, wait, well, wait a minute, what happened to Mother's Day? What happened to Father's Day? Did they not celebrate that? And then especially if you have a book that continues over the winter, you want to show what that character did for the holidays. You want to show his or her unique perspective on the holidays, what that character's uh, traditions were, whether they followed the family traditions or broke from them. There's so much that you can reveal about a character by showing how they go through the holiday and how they celebrate it or don't. Yeah, I agree with that. I think I, I'm guilty of this. I'm guilty of, of ignoring the fact that, that holidays exist in my fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I, I really feel like my fiction would be stronger if I would just think about that. And when am I setting this? Um, and and what time? Is it the Fourth of July? Are, are they seeing flags popping up everywhere? Is it you know Christmas with the Christmas lights? Is it Halloween with pumpkins everywhere? Whatever it is, um, just being aware of that. Having mom call. Uh, you know, it's Mother's Day. Were you ever going to call me? Ah, gee, mom, I'm sorry. I was trying to trap the kidnapper or or, or whatever it is. You know. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> But just being aware that that um, life exists outside of our characters and their own little personal bubbles, and and they're going to be influenced by that. I'm really guilty of not including the holidays, and I think I think I should be a little more aware of that. Um, now that being said, I did write uh, co-write a, a a romance, and in it um, we had to go and put dates on everything, and then we were looking back yes. at them, and I'm like, oh, so this is like New Year's Day, and they're not saying anything about New Year's like they probably would. And so we kind of backtracked and we did some stuff where we had some um, uh, Christmas 
emails that were exchanged and some New Year's mm -hmm. Day and, and stuff like that. And I think it really helped develop the characters and, and deepen and enrich in the story. Um, but the main point of the story, the main story, took place after New Year's Day. And so it was um, very much more of a summertime kind of a thing, but it was like this, this long process. But anyhow, um, it really helped develop that, and I, I, I need to do that more in my fiction. Um, well, with that in mind... It yeah, makes the characters seem more real. Because the holidays come even when we're going through something, you know. If, if my son has cancer, thank God he doesn't. That's not my situation. But you know, if your character's son has cancer, you may not think about the holidays, but the holidays are going to come upon you whether you like it or not. You know, you may be in the hospital doing a cancer treatment, but guess what? There's going to be holiday decorations. There's going to be, you know, Christmas carols playing in the, you know, on the radio on your way there. So I think that. If you put that into your novel, it makes your reader feel like, wow, that's a real person in a real time. Things are actually happening. It's not just a story about a murder mystery. Right. It makes it feel more real. So then do you think that we should set all of our stories during some sort of holiday? Should we just be like, this is going to be our Valentine's murder mystery. <laughs> this is going to be our 4th of July thriller. Well, you could certainly have a, a series that's, you know, that, that's focused around the holidays, but... Um, like I said about, you know, the if your title is about a particular holiday or there's a you know, that plays a major part of your plot line, that does limit you to only being able to sell that book during that holiday. And with Christmas, you know, maybe next Christmas you might still sell a few copies, but that book's not new for Christmas this year. It's last year's Christmas book. So you're not going to get as much sales. And so I think that if... And I, I would never want to limit an author to say, you can only write about the holidays. I think we need to write whatever God's put on our heart, given us a passion to write. If there's a holiday in there, mention it, deal with it, show how your character responds to it. But I wouldn't necessarily limit it to, oh, well, this is a great story, but there's no holiday around it, so I can't write that. Absolutely. So I, I might... Uh brag a little bit here on Molly if, if that's okay. I don't know. Molly, are you okay with me talking about your current work in progress? Yeah, sure. Good. I'd love so, to hear about it. Yeah, she's writing a kind of a suspense thriller mystery um, set in New Orleans. New Orleans. Um, and um, in it, they, they're they celebrating um, Halloween, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and so it's it's interesting for a California boy to see how Nolans does Halloween. <laughs> and so that, I, I could tell, was kind of a fun moment for her. And she had a, a great moment where, you know, California girl goes into the, the Halloween store and she's trying to pick out these dainty little decorations. And, and her <laughs> friends are like, oh, sweetheart, you've never been to Nolans. It's not how we do things here. <laughs> it's you know, all voodoo and, and, and really dark stuff over there. Not all of it, but a good portion of it. Yeah. And, uh, that that was yeah, actually that was fun to write, and I had a lot of support and help, and still do from the New Orleans Tourism Bureau. They connect with me on a daily basis through Twitter or social media, and give me tips. And if I have a question, I get to ask them, and they send me links for everything I need. So it's it's a really they've they've been very instrumental in helping me write this very authentically. Yeah, but will they send you beignets? <laughs> well, the, the, there is chatter about them hooking me up with Cafe Du Monde, so yeah, uh, I'm expecting that in right. about a year. Yeah, I was going to go on record here because this is being recorded. Uh, I was at Cafe Du Monde before the before Katrina and them came through and stuff, oh. and it's back. But oh yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll share this podcast with them tomorrow and see what we can come up with. Maybe somebody will come home with a nice little Christmas basket of beignets. There you, go. <laughs> you can't go to New Orleans unless you go hungry. Okay. <laughs> uh, I get it. I get it. See, that makes sense. So, excellent. Well, um, that's kind of what we have here for writing about the holidays and, and uh, with the backdrop. I was actually going to mention one more thing. Now it occurs to me before we sign off, so that's nice. Uh, one of the things that I suggest to my writers... It's a very fancy term that I may have coined, but I call it semantic domains. And it's this idea of words that are all related to a particular topic. So we could say medieval England, and we start listing words like king and queen and knight and um, loyalty and fealty and, and um, I'm trying to think of jousting and all the terms that we can think of, crown, signet, um, you know, all of those words that kind of go in that particular setting. 
um, that can appeal to all of the five senses. You start listing all of those. And I think when you're writing about the holidays, you want to do that. You want to maybe make a chart um, with all the sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and, and feel, feelings such as the uh, tactile sensations of the season. Um, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you taste? What do you feel? Mm -hmm. um, perhaps the emotional context that goes along with it. Um, and all the wonderfully rich words that go along with the season um, that can really kind of help deepen and keep you from kind of relying on the old cliche descriptions of things, mm -hmm. but try to find new and inventive ways, a new way to look at things. So I always encourage my writers to do a lot of brainstorming before the actual writing about uh, what they might include in, in terms of figurative language and detail and, mm -hmm. and all of that. And um, I think there's a lot of power in that too. So um, that was my last little tip. Nobody asked for it, but there, there you got it for free. So. Bonus. Bonus. <laughs> so, uh, Pops, you have anything else before we uh, start talking about contact stuff? Oh, I no, guess I actually. Don't, I don't think so on the subject. It's. Um... You know, I'm glad to see anthologies uh, coming back. Of course, uh, the ones for science fiction had never left, but right. but in other fields, uh, these compilations I think are great because they're easy reads. You, you get one story, uh, and you can just digest that one, and then um, maybe do another one the next day. And uh, there's a real advantage to it. There's an art to writing them uh, so that they're coherent, and then editing them and putting them all together, stitching them together. So. Uh, I'm glad to see these things, uh, and a, that particular type of product uh, is really great for readers, especially with, since uh, more and more people have less and less time to read. Yes, absolutely. And you know, especially mm -hmm. at Christmas, it seems like you know we all have so much to do at Christmas time on top of all the stuff we had to do before Christmas hit. Um, so you know, to have a little compilation where you could just spend ten minutes reading a chapter, and it's not just a chapter. That, oh yeah, I have to remember what happened here when I picked the book back up in a week. You know, that it's all right there. You're done with it in 10 minutes. You've got the whole story. Um, I think that's that's really helpful for readers. Absolutely. Molly, how does the uh, chat room look? Busy. We had a really full crowd tonight. First, I want to give a shout-out to Linda Bonnie Olin. She is new to mm -hmm. Google Plus and Google Hangouts. Mm -hmm. So I'm very oh, glad to that. have her there. Yeah. So she's a lot of people saying hi. They're really excited to have you on tonight, Kathy. So that was really exciting. Um, trying to scroll back, there was a lot here. Um, Jenny Snow, obviously, she's always very talkative. I really enjoy having her in the chat room. I had asked the question when we were talking about it if any fiction books have changed the lives or part of the lives of the readers, and a couple of comments were that that's hard to pick just one. There's you know fiction. There is that one fiction book that people will remember, but overall, fiction has is a life changer or can be a life changer. Absolutely. Jenny liked the idea of selling extra books that you receive as payment for uh, being published. She has a stack of chicken soup for the soul books. <laughs> so I'm just looking back. I don't think there's too many. Oh, here's one. Kathy, Jenny wants to know, if do, in your books, do you look for one subject above another, such as romance, family drama, or comedy? Um, nope, I'm open to, as a matter of fact, I like to have a little bit of both. I really like with a compilation to have, you know, a humorous story and a drama story and a romance story, a little bit of everything. Even in 21 Days of Love, they're not all romance stories. You know, we've got some family, we've got some humor, so I like to have that combination, a little bit of everything. Nice. And then Linda was saying that she is primarily a hymn writer. She recently put together a few songs for a group of churches interested in doing a blue Christmas service, which as I understand she says is traditionally held on the longest night of the year and it is geared to people whose grief and loss make them unable to be jolly ho 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 at Christmas, mm -hmm. but it offers Christian hope and validates the sadness, mostly to comfort them. Mm -hmm. And I'm not familiar with that, but I thought that was a really interesting sweet way to, to do it. Absolutely. And that but is it. Those are the questions. Just a lot of again. Blue, uh, blue you said blue Christmas, and now all I can do is hear Elvis. Yeah, I me too. <laughs> I was waiting for somebody to mention that. I knew it had to be either you or your son was going to say it. Yep. I couldn't think. I could. I knew it was. I was like, I know Blue Christmas. I know that. I know that. How do I know that? <laughs> Everybody knows it. 
<laughs> yeah. It was, you know, and I, now that song will be in our heads all evening, right? <laughs> Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Right on. Excellent. Well, we really appreciate having everybody listen. Uh, Pops, how can people get in touch with you? Well, uh, you can still go over to my site, altengansky.com, which you see on the lower third there. Uh, but also visit uh, the Blue Ridge Mountain Christian Writers Conference site, which is just the initials, B-R-M-C-W-C, Blue Ridge Mountain Christian Writers Conference. Or I think you can link there from um, my site. And tomorrow I have a post going up about dealing with uh, criticism because there's one thing that's certain in the universe. If you write something, someone will have something to say about it. Yep. Absolutely. So I draw from a couple of stories in, in my life. Excellent. Those are always the best ones. So, And Kathy, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, well, my website is www.kathyide.com. It's K-A-T-H-Y-I-D-E.com. And we have a website for the Fiction Lovers devotional series. It's fictiondevo.com, D-E-V-O. And we have a uh, free study guide on fictiondevo.com for both of the, uh, well, we'll, we will have them for all of the Fiction Lovers devotionals that contain additional questions written by the authors of each story if you want to go a little deeper either individually or uh, in a group setting, a Bible study or book club, uh, something like that. Excellent. And Molly, how can people get in touch with you? My blog is franklymydearmojo.com. I'm on Twitter at realmojo68, and I'm all over Facebook. Awesome. And I'm Aaron Gansky. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on the Twitter at ADGansky. Um, and you can always find me online at aaronganski.com. While you're there, don't forget to ask the author for your chance to win a free audible copy of The Bargain, which again is just the guy who read it is fantastic. Couldn't be happier with that. I agree. Um, it's it's a very yeah. good... That was the first audiobook I ever read, listened to. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah, I was really, really pleased. A quick funny story. I told my publisher which guy I wanted to, to read it and he goes, oh, he was my third choice. And I said, well, that's fine, but you were wrong the first two times. So... <laughs> I don't, I don't know if you laughed or not, but I thought it was funny. Anyhow, oh, uh, next I'll, week. Yeah, go ahead. I, I just wanted to mention um, the uh, ebook for 21 Days of Christmas uh, has been on special for $4.99, and today's the last day it's on special. So Ooh. if you wanted to get, uh, just go to Amazon.com and uh, look for 21 Days of Christmas and get the ebook for $4.99. Uh, today's the last day. Live listeners, you're in luck. <laughs> and those of you listening on the audio podcast, <laughs> full price for you. That's we your apologize, punishment. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's their punishment. They should have been here live. Uh, rearrange your schedules. Right. What's wrong with you? Yes. Um, well, we are talking next week about world building, where we will probably say something about coming up with holidays for your world. Um, and uh, we hope you can join us for that Tuesday night, 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we thank you all for listening. And until next week, good writing. <laughs>